Try that. It was. Try that. All right. How's that? All right. Let's try it once again. Good evening, everyone. Man, a good turnout tonight. Would you look at a few people and say, it is good to see you tonight? If you're online, we welcome you this evening. But uh, so many people out visiting for the first time or maybe the second or third time on a Wednesday night, but uh, so glad to have you guys with us. Uh, could you just one more time, uh, just look at everybody around you and just shout this, welcome. welcome. Yeah, it is good to have you guys here. In a few moments, we're going to be kicking off a new series called Encountering Counter Culture. Uh, before we get underway, I, I just want to ask this question. When you think of the word culture, what do you think of? We're not officially beginning the sermon, but as we get underway, when you think of the word culture, what do you think of? Cheese, all right, that's one thing. I knew something like that would come. What else? A way of life. A way of life, that's good. What else? What the majority considers normal. Good, yeah. Anything else? A lifestyle. It's good. Anything else? One more answer, which is, those are probably better answers, but one more thing I'm looking for too. Is there, take a culture, I guess like a biology culture, you take a culture. Yeah, that, that's not what I was looking for, but that's good. What's that? Core beliefs, our beliefs, yeah, our beliefs. Yeah, that's fine, anyone else? What about things such as art, music, and, and all of those things, the humanities, if you will, oh, the humanity, right? The humanities of, of life. When we look around us, our world is uh, entertained, if you will, by things that we enjoy. Uh, any sports fans here? Let me see your hands. Yeah, any, any, any Yankees fans here? Yeah, we'll be praying for you, but uh, uh, they're sports fans. Any, any music fans here? How many like music? How about, how about any uh, classical music? Any classical music? You need, you need culture for classical music. Uh, any any uh, uh, people here like uh, bluegrass music? You don't need culture for bluegrass. I'll just say that, all right? Hey, 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 hey. hey. How about art? I mean, when I talk art, I'm talking like pictures and drawings. Anyone here like that stuff? Do you? Okay. Now, you may like to draw. Now, I still can't understand looking at some of this artwork and trying to figure it out what it is, and someone else says, this is X, Y, Z, and you're like, how do they get that? But these are all part of culture, but in our, in our society today, and, and really in our topic tonight, what we're going to take a look at is going to be taking a look at the, the way, the, the morals and the ethics of our lives and how that has differed from what God has told us to do. Now, before we get underway this evening, we're going to open up in prayer here in just a moment, but many of you are aware, uh, uh, many of you know who Kathy Gleckner is, and she may very well be watching tonight, I do not know, but uh, one thing we are going to do is, is say hello to her, I'm not going to do it, uh, I thought about giving her a call, but then I thought I'm just going to do a little quick little video clip of us saying hello to her, but uh, many of you are aware that she broke her hip uh, just on Sunday night. I had forgotten she had told us, uh, told me that she was going to be going down Sunday after church to visit a friend at State College. She got down to State College, was on her friend's floor, turned around, slipped, and broke her hip. So she had successful surgery yesterday, which is good. But what I want to do tonight is I'm just going to uh, give a li- get a little video going. I'll send this to her in a little bit later. But just from her church family, can you guys just wave at her and just one by one as I come by your section, just shout out, hi, hello, we love you, whatever you want to say. Uh, and uh, then we'll get this sent out to her la- later. Uh, tell you what, I'm going to start on this side. So you guys ready? Ready. All right, here we go. On the count of three, not, not yet. All right, three, two, one. All right, we got it. So I'll send that to her later. So thank you very much. We want to open up in prayer tonight, and then we will get right into our word tonight. So Father, tonight, through the name of Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. And Lord, I pray that you'll allow your glory to be displayed unto us and through us, Lord, as we look at your word, as we discuss things that are going on in this world. Lord, these people are here tonight because they don't want to be partakers of the world. They're, they're in the world, but they don't want to be of the world. So Lord, I pray that you'll give us the ability to hear your voice speak directly to us. Father, as I've prayed so many times, 
It really doesn't matter so much what I say as much as what you say to us. I understand that you use people. You'll use me tonight. You'll use others to speak forth your word. But Lord, as we look at this new series, Encountering Counterculture, I pray that you will help us to have an understanding that you are the one who has established the morals. You are the one who has established the ethics for the way we should live. And I pray that you'll help us to have a passion to do that tonight. We honor you in Jesus' name. Can somebody shout amen? Amen. 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 Once again, so good to see so many of you out tonight. And uh, Tony and Mike, thank you for volunteering. Would you guys do me a favor tonight? Uh, I, I, I got to say, I probably did not have enough faith tonight. I printed out 30 of these. Uh, so if you're a couple or if you don't mind sharing with somebody beside you, maybe just kind of do that. But we're going to pass those out tonight. And do me a favor, as those are going out, uh, just don't, don't feel like you've got to look at them just yet if you get them before we get to them. All right, we are going to be diving into this brand new series called Encountering Counterculture. Would you say this with me? Here we go. Three, two, one. Encountering Counterculture. Say it one more time. Encountering Counterculture. Now, I want you guys to say that with me in part because I have a tough time reading this really fast or saying it really fast. It's kind of like toy boat. How many have ever tried to say toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat? Uh, how many have never tried to say that? Yeah, go ahead. Try to say that five times fast. Toy boat, toy boat. It, it is tricky. <laughs> encountering counterculture is tricky to say, but how many know that encountering cult, encountering, I see, I'm, I'm struggling already, encountering counterculture is not only tricky to say, but it's tricky to live. Let me say that one more time. Everyone paying attention here. Encountering counterculture is not only tricky to say, but it's tricky to live. Would you look at somebody and say, it's tricky to live? As we get into this tonight, I'd like to ponder a curious thought that I have as we get into it. 25 years ago, for those of you who are old enough to remember 25 years ago, there was a phrase that was relatively common uh, it's still relatively common today, however, not quite as common, but it was dare to be different. How many have ever heard that phrase, dare to be different? Sure, oftentimes you'd see a, a poster and it'd have a, a goldfish swimming in the wrong direction or it would have a person looking the other way or it would have a light bulb that was lit up and none of the, other, none, none of the others were lit up. Um, you, you'd see it on inspirational posters. You'd see it as public service announcements. You'd hear celebrities promoting the idea, dare to be different, dare to be different. Would you look at someone and say, dare to be different? Dare to be different. But now, some 25 years later, you really don't hear that phrase too often anymore. Now, you may hear it a little more in church than you hear outside the world, but really, you don't hear that phrase, dare to be different, as much as you did 25 years ago. And I want to ask you this question tonight. Why do you think it is, assuming that it is, that we don't hear the phrase dare to be different as much as we used to a couple of decades ago? Why do you think? They want everybody to conform to one thing. They want everybody to conform to one thing? Uh, maybe. So, Pat, did you say something? <laughs> what did you sort of say? Because everything is so sort of different. All right, let's flush that out a little bit. Someone else. Why don't we hear that phrase as much, dare to be different? It is normal to be different. All right. Let me just kind of stop right there. As we look around the world, what 25, 30, 40, 50 years ago, what used to be considered a cultural norm, now anything goes. Anything goes. If, if you want to be a certain persuasion sexually, no problem. If you want to wear certain clothes, no problem. If you want to wear your hairstyle any which way, it doesn't matter. If you want to wear your hairstyle any which color, it doesn't matter. Why? Because right now, diversity is fashionable. Being different is cultural. And so for us, daring to be different, when I say for us, for us as Christians... Daring to be different is to not be like the world. Now, before we go a little bit further, let me just say this. In order to not be like the world does not mean that we have to be like the Amish or some of the more conservative versions of the Mennonites that only wear black clothes, no zippers, drive in a black vehicle. 
I find it interesting that Amish people will, will wear these clothes because they don't want to stand out in the crowd. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. But by being so different, what do they do? They draw attention to themselves. I want you to notice this first article by Gallup. It says 10 major, and, and any, anyone have a copy? I didn't get a copy. I need to get a copy. Uh, to, to tell you what, can, Amanda, can I borrow yours or, or can Cindy look on with you there? Let Cindy look on with you. Thank you, Tony. Actually, he's brought me on one. All right, thank you. Um, I, I, I want you, actually, no, I need that after all. Uh, I want you to notice this, what it says. Ten major social, cha social changes in the 50 years since Woodstock. How many of you are old enough to remember Woodstock? How many know Woodstock was more than just the bird on the peanut show, right? All right. Notice some of these changes. We're not going to look at them in detail, but number one says this. Religious attachment has waned. Isn't that a surprise, that a religion attachment has waned? Number two, marijuana legalization has gained support. Number three, interracial marriage has gained acceptance. That's not necessarily a bad thing there. Then you flip over the page, you'll see number four, the majority of people now think that the first trimester abortions should be legal. Number five, Americans have become willing to vote for a woman for president. That's not necessarily a bad thing either. Number six, willingness to vote for a black president has grown, and that's not bad either. Number seven, Americans now prefer smaller family size. Number eight, premarital sex is no longer taboo. Number nine, homemaking no longer women's preferred vocation. And number 10, support for gay rights gains mainstream. Now, I'm going to ask you to take this article with you tonight. Uh, you can look at the statistics tonight. But another thing I want you to notice is the other handout this evening. And notice the headline there. This just came out August 2nd. Today is August 3rd. This just came out yesterday. Pennsylvania Department of Education says kids can identify as transgender as young as three years old. Now, for those who might have children or grandchildren that are three years old, how many know that they barely know whether they're a boy or a girl at three years old? But yet, the Pennsylvania Department of Education says it's all right for these children at three years old to decide whether they want to be whatever gender they want. And I'm, I am going to read down through this article a little bit with you because it is relatively brief. But notice what it says. The Pennsylvania Department of Educated, or Education has updated its website. I did check the website this afternoon to allow students to select an array of different genders, and among the additional updates is a message to teachers that encourages them to ask students for their pronouns to prevent them from accidental misgendering. On the Pennsylvania Department of Education's website under the category Creating Gender-Inclusive Schools and Classrooms, the department tells instructors that if you don't know a student's preferred personal pronoun, it's always best to ask. In addition, the department explains that not all students will have traditional pronouns such as him, her, she, her, and they. Now, let me just kind of go a little bit off the rabbit, on a rabbit trail here. When I was young, I had a hard enough time trying to remember what my personal pronouns were, but now we're going to add a little bit more into it. According to the website, some people prefer to use, and you guys may have to help me out on the pronunciation, some people prefer to use the gender-neutral pronouns such as ni, v, z, z, or g. Is that the way you say that? I'm sorry? G, okay. And I know you guys are, work, both work at Cornell, so you guys are a little more familiar with that up there. Um, the website includes the definition of binary gender, which they define as the faulty concept that there are two genders, male and female, according to Fox News. Uh, I, I could find it for you, but it would take me about two minutes. I, there, there is a, there is a t-shirt. It's a real picture. I've actually showed it in church once before. But if you go on Amazon, look for a t-shirt that says there is more than one gender. All right, there's a t-shirt that says there's more than one gender. But under the options uh, of what to buy, it's do you want a male shirt or a female shirt? <laughs> I, I do find that funny. During gender neutral day, students will learn how to reject gender stereotypes according to the lesson guide. It also states that teachers should be committed to challenging gender norms in the classroom. Uh, Erica Sanzi. Director of Outreach for Parents Defending Education told Fox News that updated website is a calculated effort to confuse children about biological sex. This is part of a national effort in schools to break the binary, 
by confusing young children about biological sex and indoctrinating them into believing that gender is, spectr is a spectrum. The Department of Education should delete these ideology-based resources from their website. Anyone teaching gender fluidity to a three-year-old does not belong in a classroom, she told Fox News. Well, I want to ask you a, a few questions here. I'm not necessarily looking for an answer on this, but if you were working for the Department of Education or if you were working for a public school system, how would you handle this? And, and I say that assuming that you have a Christian worldview. Or what if you're working for a local hospital? It doesn't just have to be Guthrie. But if you're working for a local hospital, hospital and you are required to embrace homosexuality or a transgender identity as completely acceptable, what would you do? Or what if you are required, if you're working at a hospital, to suggest abortion as a viable option for women? How would you handle that? These are real questions facing people today. We are living in a world that has left its Judeo-Christian values, and we as Americans, we've been blessed over the last number of decades, and we've been accustomed throughout our history to have a nation that's been founded upon Judeo-Christian values, but, but the time of living under that blessing is pretty well over, and how will we transform with it? Now, when I ask that question, how will we transform with it, I want you to understand that we will transform. We're going to transform one way or another. Will we transform in a way that is pleasing to the Lord, or will we transform in a way that is not pleasing to the Lord? The moral culture is one that is counterculture to Christianity. Let me say that one more time. The moral culture in the United States today is one that is counterculture to Christianity, and for this series, oh, uh, for this series, this is the question that we're going to have for this series, what we're going to attempt to answer. How do we encounter a counterculture and still be true to God while living in this world? How do we counter a counterculture and still be true to God while living in this world? We have to address this question, we do. And we have to come to a satisfactory answer. We, we cannot avoid this question, or we, and listen to what I'm about to say, because I'm going to follow up with a question on this that I want you to respond with me. We have to avoid this question, or we will end up taking either the extreme of isolation and legalism, or the extreme of embrace and compromise. Let me say that one more time. We can't avoid this question, or we will end up taking either the extreme of isolation and legalism, or we will take the extreme of legalism uh, embracing and compromise. I'm sorry, let me say that one more time. We'll take the extreme of isolation and legalism or embracing and compromise. What do you think I mean by that? Again, the two extremes I'm listing here are either isolation and legalism or embracing or compromise. What do you think I mean by that? If we don't answer this question appropriately, we're going to end up going down one of those two roads. What do you think I mean? You're all wondering what I mean, right? Uh, Louisa, all right, and again, just before she speaks, again, the two extremes, isolation and legalism, or embracing and compromise. Go ahead. Nice and loud, if you will. Perhaps that we will either become, if we take the image that Jesus gave about salt, we either won't be able to be the salt of the world because we will have no flavor, or we'll be so salty that it's no, not palatable to anybody. Yeah, good. And so we won't impact the world. Okay, good. So to take Jesus' analogy, we'll either be uh, salt of the world doing good things or so salty we'll be offensive, basically. All right? Someone else. Jeremiah, I think your hand up went up as well. Yeah, so I would say it takes the act like from James, the actual wisdom from above. So it means you have to take an intentional approach to seeking God on how to do this because if you let yourself just go with the flow, then you're going to take an extreme default. So you'll take just agreeing with the world because it gets you by or maybe just defaulting to an extreme because it gets you by but not, neither is really God's actual wisdom okay so you have to seek that out so we'll either take an extreme go in, into a compromise with the world right or another extreme where we're just doing what doing well I would say um, I mean it's not God's love to isolate and not interact with the world okay so so we could take that just the isolation view as well. 
All right, someone else want to tackle that? Tony? Um, I'm totally against it. It's disgusting. Um, basically, my fear of it is basically being, like, try not to be too mean towards that person that is that way. Mm-hmm. We, we always have to show love to this world, correct? Love. All right. All right, let me, let me help answer it like this. Those of you who are perhaps my age and above, so I'm what? I'm like 25 and above, right? Uh, actually, I just turned 52. 52 and above. You may remember times where if you wanted to remain holy before the Lord, what did you do? You would separate yourself from the world, right? We, we don't, how, how's that saying goes? We don't, we don't smoke, don't drink, don't, uh, don't smoke, don't chew, don't date girls that do, right? And then, you know, if, if someone was... Um, at the office or at the school who was uh, living a worldly lifestyle, you'd be like, ooh, got to stay away from them. And so we would take that isolation and it became a legalistic approach. I want to ask you a question that you guys, I'm assuming most of you already know the answer to. Did Jesus avoid the sinners? No. Now, did he embrace the sinners as his friends because he just wanted to have them as friends? No. No. Why did Jesus embrace them as friends? Because? To to do what? Build bridges with them. Build bridges with them. Build bridges. Yeah. Build bridges and relationships so that he could show them the dynamics of the kingdom of God. So we we either again, if we if we don't answer this question correctly, we'll either take the extreme of isolation and legalism, or we'll become so watered down, as they were saying then we will compromise and we'll say, well, you know, God loves everybody, so therefore nothing must be wrong. But how many know both extremes are not right? A uh, man by the name of Vance Havner, he's a, he was a former, he's, he's passed away now, but he was a, a great man for a lot of quotes. He said this, if you are a Christian, you are not a citizen of this world trying to get to heaven. You are a citizen of heaven trying to make your way through this world. We are citizens of heaven. You may be the citizen of another country tonight, but ultimately, we are citizens of heaven. Paul said that. And and the key text for this verse is found in Romans chapter 12, and I want you to notice this with me. It's actually verse 2, but we're going to start with verse 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice. Now, what, what do you find interesting about the fact that Paul qualifies the sacrifice as living? How do you, what, what do you make of that, that he says it's living? It's active. it's active. That's good. It's good. What else? In, in the Jewish... Peggy? Well, I was going to say they don't want people to think they need to harm themselves. Right. Okay, good, good, it's good. Kelly, or is it, you're just stretching your hand. You're just stretching your hand, okay. Um, it's like an auction, don't you even blink, I'll call on you, all right. Think about the sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament. Were they living or dead? Dead. Paul says, unlike those, you are a living sacrifice. You're not laying your life down, you are alive unto God. God has made you alive. Jesus has paid the, sac- has paid the price. He says, but now you're... Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your what? Reasonable service. And here's verse 2. He says, and do not be conformed to this world, but what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. I want you to notice uh, verse number 2, the word conformed. He says, do not be conformed to this world, This word transformed is only used here once in in Romans and only one other time in the New Testament. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1. And this word conform means to conform, and and I apologize because I wrote down the wrong word, didn't, no, yeah, no, I wrote, wrote down the right word. It says to conform oneself to another's pattern. I, 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 I think I've used this illustration before, but are there any... Has anyone here ever done any tracking in the woods? Animals? Any, anyone ever, ever done any tracking? Okay, you've done some tracking. Now let me take it a step further. Has anyone ever made a plaster of Paris of a footprint? A 
Kelly, have you done that before? Kelly has, you have to, Cindy, a little bit? I am. Same thing as a hand. All right, so when you see, let's, let's just go and say you're walking through the woods and you see a bear footprint, a black bear footprint. You see that footprint and you're like, man, this is cool. I'd like to get a plaster of Paris, this, a plaster of Paris form of this. So you take the plaster of Paris, you pour it in, it eventually dries, you wipe away all the dirt, and now you have something that has conformed to this bear print. Paul uses this word here to mean, uh, mean conform to, one's, to conform oneself to another's, to somebody else's pattern. Paul says the world is around us, but he says do not be conformed to this world, world but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. This series is going to be studying how we can train our mind to learn what God's Word has to say regarding the things taking place in our culture, and in training our mind, we will be giving the Holy Spirit something to work with. Now, Nina, I, you know, I, I sometimes I look at Nina and Cliff. Nina, in particular, you grew up in a Pentecostal church, right? Like I did, Cindy did as well. Uh, a lot of times, for those of us who grew up in a Pentecostal church, it was as if people wanted to say, oh, they, they didn't always word it like this, but the, the feeling was there is, you need the Holy Spirit to work through you. Just put your minds on the shelf and you'll be fine. Nina, am I right on that? Cindy, am I right on that? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And sometimes we get those... <laughs> she looks like a bobblehead. I don't know. Uh, no. Uh, but but we, we, we kind of got that feeling like in Pentecostal circles, like we just need the Holy Spirit. You don't need seminary. You don't need Bible college education. You just need the Holy Spirit. And so often people would not have a good foundation of the Word of God because they were saying, I just need to pray, 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 and enjoy the Holy Spirit. But in reality, we need to engage our mind. Some, would, you, would you look at somebody and say, you need to engage your mind? You need to engage your mind, but also you need the power of the Holy Spirit to move what goes into your mind and equip your spirit. There is a phrase in Christianity that says, we shouldn't isolate, but insulate. We've kind of touched on this already, but what do you think that means? We shouldn't isolate as Christians, but we should insulate. What do you think it means? Cindy Lou? Yeah, we need to protect ourselves from the world, but we don't isolate ourselves from the world. We're going to go down through a couple of lengthy passages, taken first from John chapter 15, and then secondly from John chapter 17. But as we read through these two passages, I want you to notice that there are 21 times that the word world is used. Uh, the first section, Jesus is in the midst of his discussion about you are the vine, uh, or rather uh, that I am the vine, not you are the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches. It's in this discussion in John chapter 15, and then we're going to move on to John 17 here in a moment, and John 17 deals with Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But first, John chapter 15, notice what he says in verse 18 and following, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now how many know this probably was not popular preaching for Jesus? If I on a Sunday morning said, hey guys, I want you all to know that the world hates you, it doesn't make you feel very special, does it? What do you think Jesus was trying to get his disciples to understand? Let's throw this out for a question tonight. What was he trying to get them to understand? Pam? You're set apart and chosen by me. You're set apart and chosen, and that's actually in, uh, just two verses before that. In verse 16 is where it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. So that's good. You're set apart by me. What else? Yeah. Following Jesus is not going to make you popular, especially in a counterculture that is opposed to biblical values. Someone else? Kelly? Try not to take it personal. People don't dislike you because they don't like you more. Yeah. Try not to take it personally if people don't like you. Can I just speak to Chris Gray for a second? Chris Gray likes to have people like him. All right? Chris Gray likes to have other people think that I'm nice. How many think I'm nice? All right, thank you. I feel better already. But how many know that if if I go out into the world and everybody thinks I'm nice, 
then I'm failing in my job as a, not as a pastor, in my job as a Christian. As a disciple of Jesus, if everybody in this world thinks that I'm a nice guy, then I'm blowing it. Who would you say was the nicest person that's ever lived? I, I would say probably Jesus. How many think Jesus is probably a good answer? Jesus is the answer, right? All right. Jesus is probably the answer. He's probably the nicest guy that ever lived. But how many know the crowd still wanted him crucified? So how is it that you take the nicest person who's ever lived, he's undoubtedly the most loving person that has ever lived, yet the crowds wanted him dead? It's because there was a blending of love with truth. Jesus did not mince words. He spoke what he needed to speak. Now, let me just by the upper raised hand would say, how many have ever had children that had, uh, how many have ever had children that at some point in their life didn't like you? Let me see your hands. All right. Now, does that mean that you were bad parents? Not necessarily. You may not have been the best parents. What does it mean? It means probably that you were showing them love, but that love may have had to have come through discipline. When you discipline your children, they don't always like it, they don't always receive it, but yet you are sharing truth with them. Jesus spoke truth. There were, as I've said before, there are two main reasons why Jesus came into this world. Number one, he came to reveal the Father, and number two, he came to redeem the fallen. Say that with me. He came to reveal the Father, and he came to redeem the fallen. Just say it one more time. He came to reveal the Father and redeem the fallen. Those are the two main purposes why he came. We all know that he came to redeem the fallen. That's his work on the cross. Oftentimes what we forget is that he came to reveal the kingdom of God and what that kingdom was all about. And the kingdom of God was more than just about miracles, healings, and all of that. He also came to reveal the truth of the kingdom of God, that we have to live righteously because there is a coming judgment. We have to live morally. We have to live ethically according to God's plan because God has a plan for this world that goes above and beyond our ability to understand. You, most of you have lived long enough to find out that God's ways make sense. Does that make sense to you, what I said? God's ways make sense. Why do you agree with me? Or maybe you don't, but why do you think God's ways make sense? What do you think? Why do you think God's ways make sense if you do? Because he created us. Amanda? I'm sorry. Because he created. He created us so he knows about us, right? Yeah. Does he want what's best for us? Yes. Of course. All right. Uh, let, me, let me just throw this out. Uh, we, we know that the Bible speaks, about, uh, speaks against being a drunk, a drunkenness. How many think that makes sense, that we shouldn't get drunk? How many think that adultery tears families apart, but God told us not to commit adultery? Uh, how, how many know that, that if, if God tells us not to be greedy, that greedy can lead us down the wrong road? If he tells us uh, to be honest, that if we lie, we can get ourselves in a heap of trouble. God does, you, you, let me put it this way, you cannot think of any, what we might call a prohibition that God has given humanity that in the long run doesn't have our best interest in mind. In other words, everything that God has said, I want you to stay away from this, stay away from it, because it, it makes sense. It will bring quality of life to our being. So he told them, you're not of the world. If you were of this world, the world would love you, but because you're not of the world, you're, uh, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world will hate you because the world is not going to want you. He's, he's not, let me put it this way. The world is not going to love you because you are not going to be giving them the blessing for their life. All right, let's move on to John 17. This is in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those, you have, for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all are mine, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but those, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep your name through those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that's Judas, that scripture might be fulfilled. But now, 
Let's see, I got All right, one more verse. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So understand that God's, Jesus' desire was for us to have joy. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Notice what he says. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone. And I want you to notice what he says here. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. All right. Are there any believers here tonight? All right. Understand Jesus is praying for you here. He says, I do not pray for those alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they also may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe. So that the reason why God wants us to be one, to be unified and to be kept out of the world is so that the world may believe. Verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me <clears throat> once again 21 times uh, jesus used the term world i i want you to describe in context here what do you think jesus means by the world is he talking about the earth what do you think he's talking about what's he mean by the world let's define this describe it tonight People, okay, okay, people in the world, Christians, not non-Christians, non-Christians, someone else, people you come in contact with, okay, the world's values, okay. anyone, anyone add to that, the world's values and what else, the world's culture, let's, let's, let's keep fleshing that out because I want you guys to continue to, to get this, so we got the world's values, the world's culture, the people of this world, what else? The morals. Beliefs. Yeah. What else, man? The morals. The morals. Good. You beliefs. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, maybe we need to define those beliefs, culture, and everything as, as the culture that would be opposed to God's. All right. Culture God's that would be opposed to God. God's culture. Yeah. Anyone else? One more thing. I'm kind of looking for. All right, when he speaks up, uh, Fran. Jesus knew when he created the world what he was going to look like in 2022. And I think he was praying for the feeling that he knew it would be coming and it would be godly, that we would have to live in and that we would have to make our choices. Yeah, so he's praying for us even all the way. That's why I say he's praying for the believers all the way up through. All right, let me, let me ask you this question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe this for you here in a moment. But when he uses the word world, do you think that he's, he's just talking about the earth and the people on it? What do you think? You, you may not want to answer this one, but what do you, any, any thoughts? I'm sorry? The spirit world is included in this as well. This is really kind of more of the one extra thing I was looking for. Um, There is a spirit world that includes the devil, the demons. We, we are aware of that. The Bible talks about it in, in, a numer in numerous locations. There is a spirit world that, that the devil in Ephesians 2 is referred to as the prince of the power of this air, of, of the air. And that is part of the world's systems as well. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. I want to ask this question as we begin to um, describe what the world is, uh, but before, let me just read this, this verse first, these verses. I, I was kind of surprised no one mentioned these verses, but many of you are familiar with this. In 1 John chapter 2, he says, do not love the what? The world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And notice what he says, for all that is in the world, the what? Lust of the flesh, the what? Lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of God will abide forever. 
Uh, we just came out of our series on the book of Genesis. Notice we talked, remember we talked about Adam and Eve. Uh, Eve in particular, she, she saw that the, the fruit was, was pleasing to the taste. She saw that it was good to the eyes and she heard the, the devil say that it would make her wise. So you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus faced those same tempt- temptations in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4 as well. But he says, this is what the world is. James chapter 1 lets us know that everyone, he says, don't let anyone say that he is tempted by God, but everyone is drawn by his own desires and enticed. We have desires inside of us that can be healthy, but yet God uh, wants us to keep those desires in check because the devil will tempt us. He will entice us. He will uh, dazzle us with things that look good. They call out to our desires. And if we are not careful, we can find ourselves going astray. I want to ask you this question. As I, as I make an illustration, how, well, how would you define the difference between a house and a home? A house and a home, you might say, well, those are the same thing. Not necessarily. And since they're not necessarily the same thing, how would you define the difference between a house and a home? And I'm going to use this as an illustration to get into a little bit more about what we mean by the world. What do you think of the difference between a house and a home? Kelly? The house is a structure. The home is people. All right. The house is a structure. The home is the people in it. Um, agree 100%, but let's, let's take that just a step further uh, on the home. Not only is it the people in it, but it's what? It's what? The atmosphere of the home. Yep, good. The relationships they have with each other. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary, what? The relationships they have with each other. The relationships they have with each other. Good. Chuck? What they represent. What they represent, the values they represent, morals, yeah. Yeah. Um, just about all of us are familiar with the phrase, home sweet, home. home. You never heard house sweet house. Uh, well, you may have heard it. I don't know. I don't want to say you haven't, but, but it's home sweet home because why? Because it's there where you have security. It's there where you, hopefully you have security. It's there, hopefully you have love. It's there where hopefully you have good relationships. It's there where you can make yourself at home. Now, some people would say, I feel at home in the woods or I feel home at the ocean. Uh, anybody feel at home at the ocean? Yeah. Or how many, anybody feel at home at the wood, in the woods? Yeah. Some of you feel home there. Why? Because it's not just about a building. It's about a physical location. Or it's, it's not just about a physical location. It's about a place of security, a place of values, a place of relationship. Now, why do I say all that? Because of this. I want to give you a couple of Greek words, nothing major here, but the word G or G, however you want to pronounce it, is earth. Anytime in the New Testament you see the word earth used, G is physical and concrete. By that, it's real or tangible, like a house, yet it's immoral. What's that mean? It has no morals to it. It's it's just a house. Cosmos can be physical. That's the word for world. I didn't put that in there, did I? No, that's the word for world. I'm sorry. I should have put that in. It's the word for world, cosmos. Uh, When you think of the cosmos, you think of the things outside. um, you You look at the cosmos. Cosmos can be physical and concrete as it can also include not only the earth, but the entire created universe. But in the New Testament, it's most often used in an abstract sense. Like a home, there are values, belief systems, and expectations. So I want you to understand, when you read the New Testament, 21 times in the passages we just read, Jesus referred to world. He's not just talking about the physical earth. He's talking about the value system that takes place on the earth. And that he refers to as the world. And that world system does not just take place on the earth. It takes place in the spiritual world as well. So as we are getting ready to close tonight, I want you to think of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. Many of you may be aware that uh, the word transformed means to be, uh, is metamorphous, metamorphoso, which means like a butterfly goes from one thing to another, one form to another. He says, I don't want you guys to be conformed to the world like an animal track uh, that has plaster of Paris poured into it. I don't want you to take on the form of this world, but instead I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Through this series, we're going to need to remember a number of things, but there are four things that I want to give you as takeaways today, and they are these. Number one, I want you to remember this. We are most certainly not the first Christians to experience a counterculture society. Someone explain what I mean by that. Well, if you lived in the 70s, you lived in the 
Yeah, yeah, it would have been countercultural to the to Christianity at that time for sure. Someone else. The first generation Christ seemed to live in a culture where Caesar was God and worship was God and just all the other craziness that was going on in the Roman culture. Nicely said. The first century Christians, Nero was God. The Christians were persecuted. They were part of a pagan society that had nothing to do with God. Uh, I, I want you to understand, there's, there's approximately 40 or so people in this room tonight. Hopefully, every one of us is Christians. I don't know that, but hopefully we are. But understand that a group of 40 individuals in any city in Asia Minor, down into northern Africa or west of Jerusalem, was probably very rare. So what am I saying is that the early church was going out into a world that largely had no faith in Jesus Christ whatsoever. What were they doing? They were going out and they were hoping to transform culture. I want you to think about all of the things that, and I don't have a list here, but I want you to think about all the ways that Christianity transformed culture. Can we just name a few of these things today? What are some of the ways from what you know of history or what you know of Roman culture, Greek culture, what are some of the ways that Christianity has transformed culture? What do you think? Kelly? No child sacrifice. No child sacrifice. Good. What else? Monogamy. Monogamy. That was good. What else? In other words, married to one person. Someone else? Judicial system. I would like legislation and laws. Yeah, judicial system. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was, that was part and parcel of it as well. What else? I, I'm, I'm waiting for some of you females to respond here. Peggy. I was gonna say, women's rights. Women's rights. Uh, how, many are, how many are glad that you had the opportunity to come to church today? Uh, in the Roman culture, you wouldn't have been allowed to go into a marketplace and to study in a philosophical kind of environment. So, so women's rights. How about hospitals? How about education? How about some of the arts? Now, we understand there was art then, but... But, but if you look, start to look at through the Middle Ages, uh, you see that the Christian Renaissance really began to just tra change and transform culture. The culture was transformed as people went out into the world. However, they experienced difficult times. We know in the first century that thousands of believers were persecuted and killed for their faith in Christ. It wasn't until 313 AD when Constantine had his vision that Christianity became accepted uh, as became accepted within the culture. So we need to remember, we are certainly not the first Christians to experience a counterculture society. So even though the last 200 years we, plus we have lived in America as a nation that has seen Judeo-Christian values, let's not be surprised because it's been abnormal through history. The rest of the world has not experienced this. As a matter of fact, uh, Mary, uh, Kenya? No, not Kenya. Kenya, Kenya. Kenya. Yes, you come from Kenya. Now, Kenya has a, a good Christian contingency in it, yep. but what are some of the nations surrounding you? Uh, Sudan, Somalia. I'm going to stop you right there. Sudan. That doesn't have a large uh, Christi Christian culture there, does it? Mm. No, mostly uh, Muslim, correct? Yep. All right. Do you, do you know of people in Sudan, and you may or may not, that have been persecuted for their faith in Christ? I've heard of it, yes. I'm sorry? Yes. You do know some, okay. And I don't want to put words in your mouth. So understand that in this world today, if you were to go to the Sudan, that, or to Sudan, that your Christian message would be persecuted. Why? Because one, you're talking different theology, but two, you're going to be implementing different values than the values that they would believe as a Muslim or an Islam. Around this world today, those who are not Christians have different value systems. But Jesus Christ has given us a value system that is good. All right, secondly, we won't spend much time here. Our citizenship is where? In heaven. The majority of us here are United States citizens. We belong to the United States, but yet we live in a kingdom that is not of this world. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, you've heard me reference this, that we are seated with Christ where? All right, what do you think that means? Most of you would say, well, I'm seated here in Athens, Pennsylvania, at Greater Valley Assembly of God, but yet the Bible says I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. What does that mean? That we're positionally, we're in Christ. He's seated in the heavenlies, so we are in him. We are also seated in the heavenlies. 
All right, I, I agree 100%, but I'm going to ask you to qualify that just a little more. Positionally, we are in Christ, so we are seated with Christ. Christ is in heavenly places, so therefore we are with Him. But Mike, I'm looking at you, my friend, my brother. You're seated right here, you're seated right here in front of me. What, what do you mean you're seated in heaven too? How is that? You're in Christ. You're in Christ, yeah. yeah. Uh, Vanessa, we're joint heirs with Christ, right? But yet, how? Spiritually speaking, right? We're body, soul, and spirit. Keep in mind, your flesh is here, but yet spiritually speaking, even though the Spirit's probably contained within this body, yet spiritually speaking, you're with Christ. So therefore, our citizenship is in heaven. I've mentioned this to you before, so please forgive me for being redundant. But Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther from the 1500s, he took the verse uh, regarding Jesus who said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and render unto God the things that are God's. He said, from this we can learn that there are two kingdoms, and we need to belong to, two, or belong to both simultaneously. He said, there is the, the horizontal, there is the vertical, let me start with the vertical. There is the vertical, render unto God the things that are God's. We belong to heaven, so we need to understand there is a king of, of which we are part of his kingdom, king's domain, but then also there is part of the 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 horizontal or the civil way of living uh, life as well we belong to god but yet we also are part of this world so therefore render unto god the things that are god render unto caesar the things that are caesar's i also like what someone said render unto to uh caesar the things that are caesar's but not a penny more in other words you don't have to give more taxes than you have to but yet still we have the obligation to do that anyone want to add any comments or thoughts on that so far so, so keep in mind that when you die, you're not just going into the ground. You're not going to cease to live. You're going to continue to live. It's just going to be in a different location than you ever experienced here on earth. So you've got to keep that in mind. Third, the devil still has sway in the world. Now again, the world here is not just the earth, but it has sway in the world. Let me just ask you this question tonight. When you look at the media that comes across through uh, movies and music, how do you see the influence of the devil and of the world in that media presentation? Filth, okay. I, I, I don't want to say let's define that filth. I don't want to go too, too detailed here. But, but can you explain to me a little bit more what you mean by that? What do, what do you see in movies and, and in music today? What does it promote? Violence. I'm sorry? Violence. Violence. It promotes violence. I'm sorry? Sexuality. Sexuality. And, and typically, uh, how, how many know that, that most, not that you've studied it, but most sexual scenes in movies or on TV deal with someone that is not married? Keep that in mind. What else does it promote? desensitizes God's values. Certainly does. Yeah. Let me, let me put it this way. Uh, Cindy and I were talking about this the other day. How many are glad that gas is under $5 a gallon? Yeah, we're glad. Now, now, how many would still like to see it go back under $2 a gallon, right? But how many know, what, what's gas at right now? About, three, about $4.40 a gallon? $4.40? $4.55 right now, right, right around there? But how many know we're not complaining about it being four fifty-five as much as we were um, when it was five dollar? You know why? Because we're now a little bit more desensitized to that gas price. We're a little more willing to pay that price because at least it's not five twenty anymore. Thank God for that. So I, I'm willing to pay four fifty. But what's happened? We become desensitized. Spiritually speaking, the media does that. It'll show you the values of the world, not the values of God. It'll show you that homosexuality is okay. It'll push that agenda and say it's all right. It'll, it'll celebrate the transgender movement. It'll celebrate sexuality outside of marriage. It'll, it'll promote violence. It'll promote even sports to say, well, you don't need God. You just need these things to entertain. It'll promote, promote uh, riches and wealth as the way to be happy. All of these things the devil will use to try to get you to be desensitized to the things of this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And fourth, and we'll get ready to close with this. We need to remember 
We will not change the world around us completely, so we can't let the world change us. I want you to think about who the most powerful man that ever walked this earth was. What was his name? Jesus. I want to ask you a question. Jesus, we know, did change the world. But as far as the world around him, he, he typically lived in the town of Nazareth, um, spent a lot of time in Jerusalem as well. What do we know about the town of Nazareth? What do we know about that? Did they largely embrace Jesus or reject Jesus? Rejected. They rejected Jesus. I don't know about you, but for me, this is almost mind-boggling. You have Jesus himself doing miracles, wonders, signs, speaking with authority in Nazareth, yet they do not receive him. They reject him. As a matter of fact, they, they at first tried to push him off the precipice, trying to kill him. That's how much they rejected him. So can I put it this way? Do not overthink your value to this world, and, and I, I don't mean that mean, but you may think, well, if, if I were spiritual enough then, then I'm telling you that the 50 people around my neighborhood, they'd be falling to their knees in repentance. Or at times, I, and I, know, I understand as pastor that I'm not doing enough for the kingdom of God and that we as a church are not doing enough for the kingdom of God and that we can make, be making a greater impact and seeing more souls saved. I know that. But yet you take the most spiritual, on-fire, Pentecostal church or any other church that's out there in a given city, they're still not winning every person to that church or to, that, to the kingdom of God. But what I also wanted you to remember is this. You can make a difference to those around you. How many have had the opportunity to lead somebody to the Lord? Let me see your hands. All right, let me ask you this. How many of you have had the opportunity to witness to somebody at your workplace or school? Let me see your hands. All right, what have you done? You have, by nature of being, to use Luis's term, well, Jesus is term, but salt and light. You've had the opportunity to be salt and light to this world. What have you done? You have changed the world around you. Now, they may not have repented in sackcloth and ashes. They may not have bowed down at your feet and said, oh, I need forgiveness from the Lord. But you have brought to them light, and what they've done with it is now up to them. We have the responsibility. But understand in this counterculture world in which we're living, we may have the answer, but not everyone is going to be responsive to that answer. As I've said before, the parable of the soils or the sower or the seed, whichever way you want to call it, three types of seed bore no long-lasting fruit. Only one type of seed bore long-lasting fruit. The soil was, was uh, I'm sorry, the seed was the same. God put the seed, the Word of God, into the person's life. What made the difference was the type of soil. The people around you, God knows what kind of soil it is. We have the responsibility to be the spreaders of the seed, but God will bring the increase. We just need to do our part. We are going to be encountering the, the culture that is, is contrary to the Word of God, but I want to help you get through this. During the next few weeks, Lord willing, and should he tarry, what we're going to be doing is looking at some of the topics um, and helping you to understand what God's Word says about them so that you can take them, understand them with your mind, and then let it apply to your spirit. As I close, I want to ask you this question tonight. I have a number of topics that I'd like to discuss throughout this series, but what are, and I'm going to write some things, a couple of things down here. But what are some things that you would like to see discussed in this series that deal with some of the countercultural things that are going on in this world that are uh, antithetical to the kingdom of God. What are some topics that you'd like to see addressed? I have some down already. What are some things you'd like to see addressed? In other words, uh, I will be addressing abortion. I will be addressing homosexuality. How do we handle these things? I will be addressing transgender issues. What else might you want to see addressed? What do you have questions about? Or maybe you have no questions. Uh, Jeremiah. Just maybe, you know, how to, how to be friends with people who have a bad lifestyle, but not so much friends that you're getting influenced by it, I guess. Okay. So how to befriend people in the world? I think 
for me, that's like the biggest one. Everything that you've listed, mm -hmm. but how to love them. Yeah, how do you love them? Where they are, because it's pretty much you either accept it or you're on the other end and it's closed off. Like, how do you reach them? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's... Thank you, Amanda. Uh, where at? All right, and Keitha. Okay. I, I, um, I, I, I like your question. You almost answered it, though. You know, I, we need to know how to respond with grace and love. That's how we respond with grace and love. But, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll address that, though. I'm going to have to address this. Well, you, you'll be watching online. I, I, I know that every sermon you're away to college, you, you watch faithfully every Sunday, every Wednesday, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Now, should we leave her for college here soon? I'm teasing. Someone else, what are some topics or things you'd like to have addressed? How do you warn somebody about judgment without sounding like... Judgmental. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How, how do you tell someone that there's a coming judgment without sounding judgmental? It's good. Or, or being judgmental. Um, because it... You, you've heard people say um, something along the lines of, you have no right to judge me. Is that true? Not necessarily. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. I've, I've talked on that before. We will get into that. That's good. I mean, just jot that down, though. What, what does Jesus say about judging? Judge the what? The fruit. Um, and, you know, if a person is living X, Y, Z, and the Bible clearly says that you shouldn't be living that way, then God, we'll just put two and two together. Let God, basically, let God's Word speak for itself. It's not really up to us, but it's, it's going to be up to that. You know, keep in mind, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, anyone remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 what Paul said that we would be, who, who we would be judging? What's that? Angels. Yeah, uh, we're going to be judging angels. And I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like or how we're going to be doing that. But in context, he says, look, if you're going to be judging angels, then you have a right and responsibility to judge people within the church. He's talking about within the church for church judgment. You've got to be doing that, um, so be, be very cautious. Don't be, don't be shutting down judgment altogether, but yet at the same time, don't be critical in, in your judgment. All right, someone else, what's another topic you might want to have discussed? Nobody come up. Someone's got to be thinking something. Oh, 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 Louisa. Perhaps some topics are very obvious, but some others we have already adopted a lot of things from the world, and I think about fashion, for example, and clothing and certain things like that or I don't know in the US but where I used to live like alcohol it was okay not to get drunk but pastors would partake of wine for example in, in the congregation so those lines that are blurry for some that have yep. already been yep. Al alcohol um, is that something that we should be partaking of or should be staying away from uh, also uh, she didn't mention this but um, Gambling, you know, what do you think about gambling? Number we have, uh, one, one, let me put it this way: one, one of the the worst statements I ever made in my life is when they were building Tioga Downs. I said that won't last long. Yeah, how many know I was wrong on that? And and I, and I, I tried every time my kids and I would drive by, by there while they were growing up. I tried to encourage them to say, "See that there? That's made with money all, that everybody else has lost." All right, which it is basically. All right, anything else? Any other topics? Uh, Peggy and then Carol. Um, what about, like, being employed by the church? Like, what about that? Like, being employed by businesses that are against what? Yeah, employed that have a pro something agenda. Like, working for Tioga Downs. Working, working for Tioga Downs. Yeah, that, it's good. All right, so being employed by certain organizations. Uh, you know, like, like working with an organization that's uh, like. A, I won't mention any, probably, probably nobody in this room knows this person, so I, I, I won't, but I won't mention his name anyway, but uh, there was a gentleman who was a pastor of church here in the area years and years ago. He retired, but then he got a job at the liquor store in town, and I was like, boy, that, that's just different. That's just different. Uh, Carol? Um, how do you deal with a family member that has decided it's a girl, and she's living with another girl? And it's wrong, but 
how do you what do you do with your family members that are in a homosexual lifestyle? Yeah. How do you deal with with, with yeah. situations such as that? Or how about this along those lines? What if a relative of yours invites you to a homosexual wedding? Do you go? Um, also, uh, I'm going to be dealing with racism and some of those social justice issues. Now, we all would, I, I think, I don't want uh, to say we all would agree, but I hope we would, that we say that racism is, is stupid. Somebody say that, you know, racism is stupid. But yet, you know, how, how do we deal with all of the uh, social justice issues that we see today? Do we embrace it wholeheartedly or do, do we kind of just say, uh, accept a little bit, not, not all of it? Uh, Chuck. Down at the hospital, every year we go through online training courses. And of late, they've been directed more and more towards diversity and culture and stuff yep. like that. And how to handle that. Yep. I don't agree with what they're saying. We still have to do it. We've got to continue to work there. All right. Thank you. Anyone else before we close? Caleb? How to have missed for those who hate God and um and Fran? No, just sorry. I was gonna say how to handle those that won't come right out and say they don't believe in God and they want there's such a coldness out there towards God. They don't want to come out and say that you know, it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, so good. And also understand too, um earlier we talked about the ways of the world being you know, uh, Nina mentioned sexuality promoted in the media. Uh, we often think in the church, well, you know, it's, they're living together and it's, it's, it's all right, but it's homosexuality we're against. No, God has standards for sexuality as a whole, and we're going to address some of those topics. I'll tell you what, let's close in prayer, and I appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, throughout this series, this is going to be a practical, theological, biblical outlook at how to deal in this culture we, we're in, because Again, we're going to be encountering counterculture on a daily basis, and we need to know how to respond. Father, today, through the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you'll give us wisdom and insight as we go into this series. Lord, it, it's going to be above and beyond my ability to teach this, Lord. It's going to require the work of your Spirit to get this through to our lives. Lord, I pray that you will cause us to hear your voice, help us to know your word, and Lord, help us to be a light, and light, to be light and salt to this world. Father, as has been pointed out, Lord, we, we can't isolate from this world. We, we, we're, of this, we're in this world, but we can't be of it, Lord. Um, I forget who said that, you know, to, to be, we'd have to be removed from this world if we're not going to be of this world, Lord. We, we need to just be preserved. Lord, we can't compromise either. Lord, we need to hold a standard yet at the same time not come across as judgmental, but just speak forth your word. And Lord, if your word comes across as judgmental, if if the word of God offends, so be it. Help us not to be offensive. I pray that you will encourage people tonight. We pray for Kathy, that you will touch Kathy, heal her body. We pray for your emotional, spiritual strength to be upon her. Lord, we pray for your emotional, spiritual strength to be upon everyone here tonight. We honor you in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Would you look at somebody and just simply tell them this, encounter Jesus. God bless you guys. Patty, thanks for being with us tonight. Good to see you back with us. Hey there, I'm Chris. I've been honored to be the lead pastor of Greater Valley Assembly of God for over 22 years. And so far, it's been a great adventure. Thank you so much for joining us online today. I'm so glad you did. Our desire here is to help people continually develop in their relationship with Jesus Christ through relevant biblical messages, contemporary worship, and great fellowship in an atmosphere where you will feel relaxed and sense the presence of God. If you'd ever like to get in touch with us, feel free to contact us. Or even better yet, visit us on a Sunday morning at 1045 a.m or on a Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. in Athens, Pennsylvania. May God continue to richly bless you and prosper you in body, soul, and spirit.